Representation matters. But as indigenous Chicano people, we can't just sit back and wait for mainstream media outlets to make it happen for us. And nor should we. We started the Tales from Aztlantis podcast because we believe that it is imperative for Chicanos, Chicanas, and Chicanex people to produce our own media and tell our own stories. And the way we choose to do this is by using Buzzsprout to host the podcast. Buzzsprout is by far the easiest and best way to launch a professional podcast. You'll get a podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and much more. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know that we sent you and helps support the show. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. Now, on with the show. You must excuse me. I've grown quite where I... This hasn't been easy, I know. But you've learned a lesson. A lesson in honesty. Honesty to yourself and honesty to others. That lesson will stand you in good stead all your life. I think we've all learned a good lesson. I've always heard that honesty is the best policy. Now I'm catching on to why that's so, and why that's so, and why Greetings, that's so, dear why listeners, so. and welcome to another episode of Tales from Astlantis. I'm Ruben Arellano Tlacatecat, and I will be your sole host for this episode. Curly is currently out in the field and could not break away. Today, our guest is Dr. Azucena Verdin. She received a master's in the arts and education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education in 2013, and a PhD in Educational Psychology from the University of North Texas in 2019. Her dissertation on Mexican origin, Borderland Mother's Experiences of Epistemic Injustice received the 2020 John L. and Harriet P. McAdoo Dissertation Award for Excellence in Research on Ethnic Racial Minority Families from the National Council on Family Relations. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Human Development, Family Studies, and Counseling at Texas Women's University. Her research centers on identity processes among Mexican origin families, including how racism, colorism, and anti-indigeneity is internalized within Chicano families. Welcome, Azucena. Thank you for being on the podcast. Um, I think we connected a few months ago on Twitter and uh, I found your work online, uh, an article which uh, we'll discuss here in a minute. But again, welcome to the show and, uh, you know, glad you were able to come on uh, in this short notice. I was wondering if maybe we can begin by discussing your dissertation. Obviously, you know, we don't have time to get into a very deep dive, but, you know, maybe just give us like a little bit of like uh, the argument, maybe some of the points that you make and some of the conclusions that you draw from your investigation. And I should mention that your dissertation is called Mothering While Brown, Latina Borderland Mother's Experiences of Epistemic Injustice. Yeah, thank you, Ruben. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to be on the show. I just want to say I'm a huge fan of this podcast. Um, oh, of, well, thank you. Yeah, of your work and Curly's work. So it's a real honor to be here. Uh, yeah, and I'm happy to talk about my dissertation and sort of the evolution of the idea, which turned into the argument and the investigation um, thereafter. So I just, I want to preface talking about my the actual dissertation, the actual research with a little bit of what the like, historical and political context was leading up to my decision to study this, this question of epistemic injustice, which I'll get to in a minute, like what that means. Um, among Latina borderland mothers, even though by the time my research was concluded, really the focus was on Mexican origin borderland mothers because those are the women that participated in my studies. It was only Mexican origin women. Um, but in the summer of 2018 was, of course, when the uh, Trump administration's zero tolerance family separation policy on the border was in full sight uh, in the media. And, you know, there were communities and people, of course, in, in, in 
Justified Outcry and all of the organizations that I was a part of at the time, the academic organizations like Society for Research and Child Development and the National Council, Council on Family Relations came out with these strong statements, right, against the, these policies and talking about what we knew then and what we know now, which are the harmful short and long-term psychological consequences of such traumatic separation. Um, in addition to just the inhumane act of separating children from, from their parents. So this was all happening right around the time that in my PhD program, I was getting ready to um, just really conceptualize what I wanted to do for my dissertation. And up until that point, the, my advisors and the research faculty that I had worked with, who were all white because educational psychology programs human development programs, family studies programs are overwhelmingly white. Um, we're primarily studying um, either issues of moral development or maternal child interactions, but using instruments, using measures that had been developed and tested and validated on predominantly white families, white mothers, white individuals, right? Which is pretty normal in the psychological sciences. So I had, through my own sort of personal development as a student, as a Chicana student in a predominantly white program at a Hispanic serving institution, but within a program that really didn't reflect that, um, had already felt sort of these struggles of like, I feel uncomfortable using some of these instruments to observe mothers and their children and how they interact and sort of you know, make assessments and evaluations on their goodness, their maternal goodness, based on these measures that I know were not designed for mothers of color, um, and which generally resulted in assessments and measurements that showed them in a very deficit light, right? But they did not meet sort of these standards that these other sort of quote unquote good, better mothers um, met. So I was already kind of uncomfortable with my training um, and, and my sort of, uh, you know, toolbox of research methodological instruments that I could sort of pick from to design my dissertation study. And I knew that I wanted to focus on sort of the maternal child interaction or maternal child communication. I wasn't quite sure what exactly. So then summer of 2018 happens. Um, and I remember like so many people especially within the Latino and Chicano community, just really feeling gutted by what I was seeing. And even though I personally didn't know anyone who was being affected by the zero tolerance policies, I felt as a community, this, this, this collective grief, right? This collective longing for justice, this collective longing for what I perceived at the time to be apathy, from most people about sort of the historical reasons for why this was happening. Um, a collective longing to be like, but you have to understand, like not only is this terrible for the families it's affecting, it's terrible for the rest of the communities that are, are already in the United States, whether they're documented, undocumented, immigrant um, or not, or non-immigrant because of the sort of downstream effects that this this xenophobia and this vitriol and this hate has on the larger, you know, Latino Chicano diaspora. And I just want to state that I'm fully aware that the migrants who were most affected in the summer of 2018 were not predominantly Mexican, right? They were primarily Central American, indigenous. It's a very different uh, set or population characteristics of migrants than you know, in earlier sort of waves of, of migration. So I, I wanna just acknowledge that I, I recognize that. But it didn't matter at the time that I was not, am not Central American. I, I, I was under this sort of cloud of like, I couldn't, after a while I had to shut down the news and social media because the heartache in knowing that you know, with impunity, this administration, which had, you know, had made no sort of, you know, did not hold back on its racist messaging, especially against Latinos, especially against Mexicans, right, calling us rapists and murderers, was now doing things to harm families. That's the very thing I was studying. 
And I just felt like all of the, the theory and the assignments and the, the, the research training I had until then didn't prepare me. Like I, I felt so, so helpless and useless. Like, how do I help my community? How do I help myself? How do like, I couldn't make sense of it. And here I was supposed to be you know, turning into this family scholar, child development expert. And I just felt so woefully unprepared. In addition to that, my children at the time were five and seven. And I remember, you know, I was so stressed out by what I was seeing. Um, I was also stressed out because I had this dissertation that I needed to conceive of and defend. And so I took them like to a McDonald's play place. This was pre-COVID, right? So we could go to things and not worry about wearing a mask or anything like that. And uh, and they were playing and I was sitting down trying to, you know, type up some notes because I, I wanted to get done by a certain time with my dissertation. And uh, then it was time for them to go, you know, and they're five and seven, right? Little kids. And my daughter refused to go. She just threw like the biggest bit ever. And I remember just feeling this rage, just like rise through my body. And I felt embarrassed. There were other parents there who were not Latino, not Chicana. And I felt embarrassed. Here I am, it was what I was thinking, um, you know, playing into people's beliefs and stereotypes about these, you know, brown mothers. How dare they have children that they can't even control. You know, all of the narrative that was playing in the media, outside the media, in my head, collectively among our communities, all this deficit language and narrative about parents and families. And I felt like suddenly I was that, you know, I, I was embodying that. And so, you know, as someone who studies child development, I know that one of the worst things you can do to children outside of, of physically hitting them is to yell at them. You know, it's considered a form of abuse. And so I somehow managed to get my kids in the car and I closed the door and I turned around to look at them and I just screamed, I howled. It was like my Yorona howl. And I, you know, it was like this dissociative state. Like I, even now remembering it gives me chills. And I just saw the little look of fear in my, in my children's faces and their eyes wide open. Right? And that they were definitely in that fight, flight or freeze, probably freeze mode for them. And then they immediately started crying. And I just felt so ashamed, so ashamed. And I called my husband, you know, I'm, I'm privileged that I have a partner who could, you know, just come in and get them. And he came and got them. And I just, I, I went away for a day just, just to gather myself. But, but that was such a huge turning point, Ruben, because again, as someone who studies this and studies family, I was so overcome and overwhelmed by the grief in these family separations. And then these deficit narratives about, in this case, Central American and indigenous families, but that's you know all part and parcel of the larger deficit narrative about Chicana mothers, Chicano parents, Latin American parents, et cetera, that I, I just knew at that point, like this, this is what I have to do with my work. This is what I need to study. I need to help myself and the field understand how these, these messages, this rhetoric, these narratives that we tell about our families, how they affect our parenting, how they influence the way we think. And now I'm, I'm talking specifically about brown mothers now, the way we consider our maternal knowledge or cultural knowledge as either valuable or not valuable, right? Because, you know, I think about, for example, the ways that when I was growing up, my my mother, who you know was born in Mexico, she and then immigrated to the U.S. at 18, how she would take care of me when I was sick, and it wasn't always with with you know Western medicine, uh, and and you know a lot of times it was like you know sabila, like aloe vera, right? Like go get a, a piece off the plant and you know rub it on your yes, exactly, <laughs> <laughs> yes, rub it on your wound, right? Or like if I had fallen, it was not a, a you know a big fall. It was not like neosporin. It was like sana, sana, colita de rana, mm. right? So it was like a more kind of like emotional, right? A, a relationally attuned way of caring for me. But because I, at, at that point in my adult life, had achieved a certain amount of educational success, 
by really playing the colonizer game, right? By being as assimilated as I could be or acculturated as I could be, right? Checking all the boxes in my formal education. I have put all that away. That is not how I parented. I parented up until that point in, in very Western white ways, right? Like talk to my kids all the time and you know it's all about their academic achievement and um so so that led to okay I, I need to go back and I need to revisit all of the literature on attachment theories right and family systems theories that to me were like these you know these are the seminal theoretical texts in my field and really start looking at what are the arguments what are the criticisms about how they don't how they're not culturally sensitive, right? About how they, how they don't address important cultural variation among families of all um, diverse backgrounds. And so I started building that knowledge for myself. And what I kept coming back to was knowledge, right? Like there's so much in the news, especially at that time about Central American, Latino, you know, Mexican American families as being like, you know, victims of trauma, 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 trauma. And that was all true. But I think the focus on trauma, while super important, is also very limiting because it boxes us in as like these victims, right? Um, that are the recipients of this harm. And then we're studied for those effects later on in life. But we're not, we're always like the objects and never the subjects. And so I wanted to study Latina mothers in a way that made them the subjects. And what better way to be a subject than to focus on your knowing, on your knowledge, right? Like what is, what is your conocimiento? Um, and how is your conocimiento, how is your knowledge of your ways of knowing harmed by what's going on right now, you know, and at the time with the Trump administration and with the zero tolerance and later on with the, the shootings in El Paso, right? And it's all of this barrage of violence, real psychological and spiritual on our people. And so I was fortunate enough that my major advisor, she was not a, a maternal child researcher. She, her work was in moral reasoning and moral development. So she was much more about like co thinking cognitively. And so epistemic, right, having to do with knowledge and knowing and being a knower, epistemic development was very much in her field. And so when I approached her with this idea, which was still kind of fuzzy, she's like, well, I'm gonna, you know, she's white. She said, I don't know anything about cultural applications of this. <laughs> she's very honest. She's like, I can help you with the epistemic part, but you're gonna have to go out and find, um, you know, committee members who can help you with, the cultural part, that's what she called it, the cultural aspect. Um, you know, and I love her, but just to tell you how, you know, unprepared she was to talk about these issues of race and ethnicity and cultural diversity when it came to epistemic development. So I did, I found some really amazing mentors um, to be on my committee uh, who were some within uh, the department and some outside. Uh, and, you know, I proposed this dissertation which was, I, I just wanna know, right? Like if we, if, we, if we focus in on the borderlands, the site where all of this violence is happening, also personal note, I'm from Laredo, right? So I grew up as a borderlands child, adolescent, and then I left, but I have family there. If we focus there, where, you know, kind of ground zero of this violence and this, this family violence, this separation, what can we learn by talking to mothers, by hearing their testimonials? about how this messaging and the media coverage, whether they're affected directly or not, how it might influence or impact the way they think of themselves as knowers, their maternal knowledge, et cetera. So, so that's what I proposed um, and it was approved. And then of course came the, the difficult task of going out and, and collecting data. But I wanna pause because I've been talking for a long time. So I just wanna- well it's it's amazing. I, I, I'm captivated by what you're saying because I, I know absolutely nothing about <laughs> educational psychology. I was wondering, um, can you unpack that term, educational psychology? What is what is it exactly that 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 field entails? Yeah, that's a great question, <laughs> and one that's always tricky to answer. Um, so, educational psychology was my broad program, and then my 
My specialty under it was human development and family studies. So I do want to say that that educational psychology broadly is just sort of the, the science behind how we learn at all ages of the lifespan. So that could be learning in formal settings like school, or it can be learning in informal settings like family and community. So it's very similar to, I think, what is now called sort of learning sciences. So a big focus, for example, on intelligence, right, which we know um, like the research, the body of research on intelligence has been historically based in very racist ideas like eugenics. Right. And who even the idea of IQ or testing in general. Right. Testing in general. Right. So, yeah, very heavy on assessment, testing um, norms. Right. Norms for all kinds of things. Language development. Um, yeah. Academic achievement. So, so P, there were different specialties in my program. Like some folks, some students were studying like gifted and talented. Some folks were studying special education. Uh, broadly, some people were studying um, autism, uh, and then there were the, the HDFS, the, those of us who were more about like, okay, well, let's also incorporate these multidisciplinary perspectives on family, right, and what it means to learn in a family. Like, but, and I think that the, what, one of the things that drew me to that is that um, although it was an educational psychology rooted in those very Eurocentric, you know, kind of um, epistemologies and theories. There's a lot of influence from the education field, especially some of the critical education fields, which looks at things like funds of knowledge, right? Which is like an alternative way of thinking about knowledge in um, like racial, ethnic, minoritized families, right? So like, let me, let me give an example of funds of knowledge. So uh, if you think about, and uh, maybe when you were growing up, and maybe still now you might have like a calendar on your wall that you got, at, like the supermercado, I know my parents did. Right. And often I had a picture of the Pope. On it, right, or like some religious imagery, um, Catholic imagery, and um, you know, that has cultural significance within that family, within that community, but it might also be used like to teach kids about, um, you know, the importance of, of uh, schedules and routines or the importance of holidays, and it's not like this sort of white middle class way of like, okay, now we're going to stop what we're doing and we're going to have very discreet time for learning and we're going to get our 10,000 words in one day. It's more of just like, this is what you do. You were doing family, but that would be sort of one fund of knowledge that then the child would take with them when they go to school. But here's the question, depending, you know, will the teacher recognize that that is a fund of knowledge that can be used and leveraged in the classroom to explore other ideas, right? Of, of time and math and, and whatnot. And often the answer is no, right? Because of, of the K-12 education system that is so focused on testing and measurement and things like that. Um, but but yeah, so, so, so educational psychology broadly is just sort of how we learn. And then my specialty human development and family science is really based in like child development, right? So looking at growth and change um, in childhood and adolescence and then through the lifespan. So which we know less about just because so much of the focus in developmental psychology has been on children and young people, but, you know, changes in identity, um, socio-emotional changes in adulthood through the lifespan. But I will say that um, one of the, the bigger criticisms about developmental psychology or lifespan development is that, I'm sure no surprise to you, um, it's very focused on the individual. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not. So when we think about like, and it's very interiorized. So when we think about, you know, how do children learn language? How do they acquire thinking about race and racism? Um, it's all like what's happening inside. It's very individualized. It's not about the community at large and how you can relate to others around you. Right. Yeah, it's not about how you are, how we are all in relationship with one another, with nature, that we are mm -hmm. a part of nature, right? Like, it's not all, at all about that. It's like what's happening above the neck. <laughs> that's kind of all that matters. I mean, that's a bit of an exaggeration there. I would say in the last decade, there's really been a push to expand that. But um, by and large, the theories that dominate, the research that dominates is very much an individualistic look. 
So how would you describe your work interacting with this body of knowledge and what is it that your work is bringing to that conversation? Mm -hmm. I think one of the contributions of just even asking the question of like, you know, Mexican origin mothers as epistemic agents, epistemic subjects, is that two things. One, it's important to study mothers, especially, you know, Mexican, Mexican origin mothers as subjects who are worthy of research and study in their own right, and not just as architects of children's outcomes. Because often women who are mothers, it's like, oh, now you're a mother. Now we need to study you for how you're going to mess up your child. <laughs> or now we're going to study you for how you, know, you need to learn this or that so you can improve the academic outcomes of your child. But it's like, well, wait a minute. You know, th there's, there's a movement right now to call motherhood um, like to call it its own sort of developmental phase for those women who become mothers. Uh, matricides is the word. And because there are developmental tasks and developmental changes that happen when one mothers. Uh, so, so that's something that is exciting. The second thing is that right now in the child development and family studies literature, there's definitely a push for less deficit-oriented research, more, you know, a greater focus on strengths, strength-based um, findings, or, you know, how, uh, you know, uh, Latina moms, Chicana moms, you know, provide sort of, or develop or nurture resilience among their kids. By and large, it's still very much um, like what they do and not so much what they think, right? So like, we are all thinkers, <laughs> whether we're mothers, fathers, children, brothers, sisters, primos, tios, tias, like we're always thinking, we're always reasoning, um, whether we know it or not. And, but, but in the developmental and family studies research, that's like, it's, it's almost secondary, right? Because there's so much focus on what we do, what we say, um, which is, yeah, absolutely important. Well, what's, what's beneath what we do and what we say, how we reason, how we think, right? Like how we determine action in a, in a morally precarious situation. Um, and that's like, it's ignored. And when you look, if you look specifically at things that have to do with epistemic ideas, like how we know or how we reason um, or how we judge an action to be moral or not, it is overwhelmingly studied on white individuals. If, if mothers are studied at all, it's done on white middle-class mothers. And so you know, that's, that's a problem, right? Because right. we have our own approaches or, or values, right? That whether you call them more collectivistic values, whether in some cases they're rooted in our histories of oppression or discrimination in the United States, whether in some cases it's rooted in our you know, reclaiming and, and re, um, reconnecting with our, um, you know, indigenous roots, Th those are all very important factors that influence how we think and how we reason, and they are missing from the literature right now. That is exactly the reason why uh, when I reached out to you at first, uh, it was your work on not necessarily your dissertation, but your work, uh, which I think is fascinating, um, but your work on, on one of your most recent articles that was published uh, last year in 2021 called Erasing Mexican-Americans, Why Denying Racial Indigeneity Constitutes White Supremacy in Family Science. And I should point out that the, that the word erasing is spelled E and then you have the word race in parentheses and then ING, erasing Mexican-Americans. And so... I wanted to ask, since you bring it up, uh, this idea of reconnecting to your indigenous roots, people that have been studying uh, Chicanos, Mexican-Americans, you know, for the past 40, 50 years, by and large, have touched upon this notion of whether it's through the lens of mestizaje, which that has its own sort of problems, uh, but there's always sort of like this allusion to or there's not to Indianness, not necessarily indigeneity. Indigeneity is completely different from Indianness, but there's always this sort of like 
this nod towards, oh yeah, you know, this community is mestizo or this community identifies with their Indianness or they're connected to an Indian or indigenous ancestor. But it's different from just uh, pointing to it and then being immersed in that culture and in that indigenous culture. When Mexican Americans in the U.S. were reconnecting and asserting their Chicano identity, it was done uh, under the guise that they were reconnecting to their culture in Mexico, tying it not just to a generic uh, Mexican national culture, but a more specific indigenous one. And so in our attempts as a Chicano community collectively to reconnect those of us that have been detribalized and didn't have those family histories connecting us to a specific community or a specific tribe, you know, a lot of us early on, and, you know, myself included, we gravitated towards the Mexica identity. And this is going back to the, you know, mid to late 90s. And this is an identity that has been slowly emerging. You know, if if you listen to, to the show, you've, you know, we've talked about this before, right? It goes back to, you know, even the turn of the 20th century in the 1920s, the post-revolution with people like Luna Cárdenas, and then eventually with uh, Nieva López and the MCRC, et cetera, et cetera. And so out of that tradition, this, this notion of reconnecting to your indigenous roots finally makes its way north into Chicano communities during the Chicano movement. And then after the Chicano movement, they kind of go on a different journey. And, and now you have various branches of it, but it's still that same searching, that same reconnecting. And so I'm curious, like, how does your work, and, and maybe you can you know talk about your article, how does your work with educational psychology, uh, how does what you do in your field address that notion of indigeneity among Chicano Mexicanos? Mm. Oh, where to start? I'll start by addressing one of the last things that you said, which was for me to contextualize it within my field, right? Like why doing this kind of work matters in my field, educational psychology, and also um, human development and family studies. So one of the things that comes up a lot when you study Mexican-American families in, in my field is this idea of ethnic identity. And also more recently, ethnic racial socialization, which is how parents transmit messages about race, about ethnicity to their children, either implicitly or explicitly. Um, so that ethnic racial socialization has been primarily and not exclusively studied in African-American families. And there's a whole classification system that has been developed that basically breaks up those socialization messages into four types. Um, uh, cultural pride, which is kind of what you think of, like, you know, be proud of your roots. Um, egalitarianism, which is like, we're all the same, right? Which is hugely problematic for other reasons. Um, and then preparation for bias, right? So when you think about like a, a Black parent having the talk with their teenage son about, you know, wearing or not wearing a hoodie or how to behave when they're pulled over by a, a police officer, that sort of thing. Um, and mistrust, right? So this idea of like, you can't, you can't trust law enforcement, you can't trust, you know, white authority figures, that sort of thing. So combined ethnic identity and ethnic racial socialization are kind of, if you Google, like, or you just do a search, even an academic search for like, kind of what, what do we know these days about what's happening within Mexican and American Chicano families? Um, those are the things that will come up. And the, the literature on the, on the racial socialization is mixed because those categories that I just described were developed by primarily studying Black families. And there are obviously some differences when it comes to Latino and Chicano families, like immigration-related socialization, right? Like that's something that came up in my dissertation is that moms would talk about a form of knowledge that they passed on to their kids was teaching them scripts for what to do if they were at the local grocery store and they got, you know, an ICE agent came over and tried to deport their mom, you know, they would have the practice, like, this is what you're going to say. So that's a form of socialization, right? Um, so those things are missing from the ethnic racial socialization uh, literature that excludes um, immigrant or Chicano families. With respect to ethnic identity, um, when you look at how those measures have been developed and validated, I mean, they're validated measures, they, they, they do ask questions about sort of, you know, what, what is your regard? How do you think about your membership in your ethnic group? Like, you know, positive, negative, that kind of thing. But what really struck me when I looked more closely is that 
none of these instruments, none of these measures, none of these surveys actually ever like ask the participant or explain what is meant by race or what is meant by ethnicity. It's like this unexamined acceptance of, well, in the US, right? Here's how we define ethnicity. Let's see your country of origin for the most part when we talk about like these. Um, and if, you know, right here are the racial categories that you have. These are the choices that you get when you go out to renew your driver's license or when you, you know, register for a COVID vaccine or whatnot. And, you know, I know me personally and most Chicanos that I know, it's an infuriating process when you have to fill out that. Oh, yeah. Because there is, you do not <laughs> exist. You have been erased. You have to, you have to insert the, the term Chicano in there. You have to insert the term Chicano. Yes. And, and it's like, it's, it's like a nick. It's like this harm, you know, that, that to me is the epistemic injustice, right? It's like, it's it, because now you're like, I'm so mad. Someone's going to ask me to be mad. I have to explain it. Are they going to get it? They're probably not going to get it because they've done zero research on this because <laughs> they don't have to because <laughs> they're privileged because their racial and ethnic categories are all there. Um, and so I think that if more researchers understood that for a lot of us Chicanos, the issue is that well, for decades we have been told if we're not if we're not black, right? If we don't identify as like Afro Latino or you know a black Mexican to choose white, is that we do not see ourselves as white. And the question of like, well, what do you see yourself as? is hugely problematic because that language doesn't exist in mainstream research, right? Mm -hmm. So now you have to go across. Like I have to go across fields, which is a problem of access. I shouldn't have to, but I have to look into like all the work that's been done in like, you know, Chicano studies, gender studies, multiculturalism, you know, the work that you're doing in history. Like I have to go outside in order to make my argument. But then I met with, oh, but that's not based in the human development literature. That's not based in the family science literature, right? So it's this like systemic erasure where we are not seen for who we are. I will tell you that research on the research that's been done on American Indians, where there has been a mismatch between how they perceive themselves racially and how others perceive them with questions like, what are you? Or, oh, well, you're white. That the more of a mismatch there is, the, the lower their mental health meaning like there's more depression, there's more anxiety, right. there's a lower sense of self, right? Because you are not seen. And, th and that's the problem that I see in just using these instruments. Like, so let's say I want to go and, and, and design a study that looks at like, how is ethnic identity related to academic achievement in the undergraduates at my university, okay? So I recruit a bunch of uh, Chicanas, Mexican-American students, and I give them all the same ethnic identity. Well, what if among my participants, I have some, some white Mexicans, right? Blonde hair, blue eyed Mexican. And then I have, you know, also within that participant pool, Chicanas that are more indigenous looking, right? M my instrumentation has no way to differentiate the meaning that is assigned to their responses mm -hmm. because it's based on one singular understanding of race and ethnicity. And that to me is a huge problem. As a teacher, I will also say that when I when I teach about ethnic identity in my courses, and I primarily teach graduate students, but when I teach graduate students, I'll often ask the question, like, okay, when we think about you know Latinos in the US, and we think about racial diversity, right? There are white Latinos, there are black Latinos, but but what else is there? Like, what are your kinds of Latinos? Like, close your eyes and picture a Latino in your head, right? I tell my students, what do you see racially? They don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. They don't have a word for it. They, they might say brown. They might. But even that, it's rare they say that. And, and I think what has happened is this black versus white binary that dominates how we talk about race in the United States right. is so pervasive mm. that, that I think, and I haven't done, I haven't done research on this, so I don't know. <laughs> But I think sometimes what happens is this gross oversimplification where people might think, well, if a Mexican person is brown, it's just because they have some black but less black in them, right? With like, 
government for mm-hmm. our mm-hmm. history of indigenous, you know, genocide and 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 detribalization, and because it's not taught ever in the schools. I grew up in in Laredo, which is not, I mean, it's bigger now, but when I was growing up, it was still fairly small. And so I was largely ignorant of like the Chicano movement because Mm. I think where it was happening, correct me if I'm wrong here, because you're the historian, Ruben, is was in like the more, the the better educated cities, right? Like Dallas and Los Angeles. And so in, in places like Laredo, like, we just didn't talk about it. Yeah, maybe maybe not in Laredo, but if you go like to, to the valley, like places like in near McAllen and those areas, like there was activity there. Crystal City, which is also kind of like within the vicinity of that general area of South Texas. I mean, Crystal City, arguably, and, and I think I've made the case for it. And I've, I've gotten some pushback from some of my colleagues, uh, Chicano scholars, um, when I've brought this up. But I, I'm, I make the case in that as far back as 1963 in Crystal City, the activities that they were doing there can be construed under the lens of Chicano politics because they were rocking the boat. They were, they, I mean... In, in that instance, you had, the, it was a community that's predominantly, you know, Mexican-American, Chicano, and it was the politics, the local politics, was, as you can attest to this, you know, having been born and raised in, in that area, was predominantly Anglo. They're the people that run the city, they're the people that are in charge, uh, the people that are in, in the police departments, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they're the people that are basically governing a primarily brown, you know, community. And so before La Raza Unido Party emerges, before uh, Mexican-American youth organization forms, like those people organized and they ousted the entire city council and they and, and other city positions and they voted in, you know, brown folks to, into that government. So so don't discount, you know, South Texas. South Texas looms large in the broader Chicano movement. But I wanted to get back to to what you were saying about these identities and like the question that you pose to your students. When when I have these discussions about identity within the historical context with my students, I try to explain to them that we all live in in a, in a universe where we have multiple identities that are fluid and they change over time. And so you're not just one identity, you're multiple identities. You're, you're a son, a daughter, an uncle, an aunt, a father, a mother. You are also, uh, but you belong to a certain nation. In this case, we are in the United States of America. So we're technically Americans, right? And if you want to adopt that for yourself, a lot of people, you know, don't do that. You know, there's conversations about that, right? If you're someone who was born in Mexico you and you immigrate, well, you're technically an, a Mexican immigrant, a Mexican national. If you become a citizen now, you're an American citizen of Mexican descent. That makes you, by definition, Mexican-American. If you're born in Texas and, and you are proud of your Texas roots, you can call yourself a Tejano. It doesn't negate any of these terms. Chicano doesn't negate the fact that you're a Tejano, that you're an American, that you're Mexican-American, that you have ethnic Mexican background, that, that your family family as Mexicano, all these terms, they represent an aspect of who you are. And and you can look at the historical and point to those historical uh, meanings as to why that is. But when we're talking about indigenous identity, some of the things that I find problematic is, and, and it first started with this term Hispanic Indians back in the 90s and into the early 2000s. And then as of late, I've seen it morph and evolve into Latinx indigeneities. And to me, I think, well, uh, those two terms are kind of like polar opposites. How do you reconcile those two things? And, and it amazes me how Scholars in academia who are involved in, in constructing these these terminologies, I mean, what do they not see the incongruity that's going on there between these two terms? One is a term that is uh, Eurocentric in nature, right? It, it goes back to the, the idea of erasing indigenous identity in the Western Hemisphere, the word Latino. It was something that was posited by the French in the middle of the 19th century when they were trying to create that sort of Latin block against the Anglophone block of North America and uh, and England. And so the French, you know, they wanted to unite with 
uh, the so-called Latin countries because they spoke Spanish. And so the only thing that unified this Latin identity was that the French uh, people spoke French was a, a Latin derivative, Spanish, you know. So it's it's a Eurocentric label. And then indigeneity, well, you can say, and I've heard this before from people, well, indigenous is also a Eurocentric term. Yes, it is. It's, it's of Eurocentric origin, French to be specific, but... That term is exclusively applied to refer to people who are original peoples of that space that you're talking about. In our case, we're talking about the Americas. So when we talk about Latinx indigeneities, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and so I was wondering, like in your article, um, Erasing Mexican-Americans, which kind of touches on this, I was wondering if you could speak to that and also explain what you mean reducing Mexicanness to an ethnicity uh, is a practice that reproduces racism and white supremacy. Yeah, I think I'm open up my article over here, which is why I'm looking this way. That's um, <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that I was really struggling with when I wrote this article was how to even use the term or write the word Latino or Latina Latinx, right? Because as you know, in in research and any kind of scholarship. To get something published, right, you have to start broad when you're making your problem statement and gradually work your way to more narrow, right? Like the funnel. I teach the funnel. <laughs> I'm teaching my students <laughs> how to write a literature. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I have to start broad, like with Latinos. But I can't say Latinos, right? Like that's a whole other episode that I know you all have had, right? Like I have to say Latinx because of my audience, because I knew I was specifically um, submitting this to um, NCFR for their um quarterly, their uh, like magazine publication. And, um, but, but I, but I didn't, I wasn't talking about, I, I intentionally was not talking about indigeneity across Latinos because that is, whew, <laughs> like there's so much variability, variation, diversity, different histories of colonization, different histories of genocide, different histories of, of re-indigenization. I really just wanted to talk about Mexican Americans Chicanos, because we are still the largest group of Latinos in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. Even right. though that number is decreasing, we, we still are. Right? I think we're so, still like 70% or something. Yeah, it's, it's a very large number. And then if you look at sort of the latest, well, no, not from 2020, it would have been from before. From 2010, there, I think 30, more than 30% of Mexican Americans wrote in, you know, more than one race under the race um, category for the census because they, they, they rejected this idea that they were white. Um, and some other large percent that I have in a different paper that I'm trying to get published right now, um, I think it might have been also like 56, 57 percent um, identified as mestizo or mulatto. Because those were, again, those were the, the problematic terms that were made available. So, so this, like this idea of, you know, mestizaje, with all of its problematic uses, this idea of rejecting whiteness in favor of recognizing our indigenous racial ancestry is not new. It's not something that only exists in academic circles. Like the people. Are, are, are saying this, right? Like we are saying we reject the categories that you've created for us. Now, in my understanding of how like the term Hispanic and then later Latino came to dominate had to do with sort of the, the Puerto Rican and the Chicano groups coming together and basically, you know, um, compromising on a label that would give them more statistical power, right? right. Because if you could all be counted as one ethnic group or pan-ethnic group, mm -hmm. then now you have more power to, you know, demand certain benefits and things like that. So I get that. But the consequence, of course, is that now we're, we're all flattened. It's a problem because, like, let's look at the 20, 2020 election results, right? Where they said, oh, Latinos are, are now, like, there are more and more Latinos are voting for Trump. What's happening with the Latinos? And yes, you can look at pockets like the Rio Grande Valley, where there was an increase in Latinos who were who voted for Trump. But by and large, that shift were the Cubans in in Florida. No, no shade, you know, on yeah. Cuban Americans. But like, if we look again historically at 
who migrated from Cuba when when that migration began, it was white Cubans who were highly educated. And so people don't know that like I have friends that I went to school with, you know, who were highly educated, you know, white friends who were highly educated. And they ask me, what's going on with the Hispanics? What's going on with the Latinos? Why are they suddenly voting for Trump? And I'm like, ah, ah we are not all voting for Trump. <laughs> like the people who voted for Trump are, you know, let's look at it, right? The white Cubans, et cetera, et cetera. And they're like, huh. But it's, I don't think it's so much that they're educated. I think it's because uh, a lot of them um, left the the island of Cuba. The country was still being governed by Fidel Castro, and they were fleeing communism. So I think that's really what unifies them: this this uh, antipathy, this antagonism towards communism. And so they this goes along with the broader political narrative, which you know we're not going to get into in this podcast. But this notion that just because you are on the left side of the political spectrum that you by definition have some uh, sympathies for communism, right? And so the, the people who are against communism will by default, you know, gravitate towards the party saying the right things. Right, right. Yes. And thank you. Thank you for adding that nuance to the conversation. It's much needed. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's just, it's frustrating, right? Because people who just look at the, the Latino label as, you know, monolithic, either won't or can't or won't take the time to really understand these differences. And the differences are important. And, and this is getting to my paper here, because if you are a family scholar and you want to understand, for example, why there's you know, an increased rate of you know, mental health symptomology, depression, anxiety, self-harm behaviors amongst Mexican origin adolescents, well, then you need to understand things like acculturation, ethnic identity, colorism, right? Um, I don't want to jump ahead here, but, you know, if we, if we want to talk about the most recent. Well, yeah, I think this would be a good place to sort of segue into that. Your article doesn't specifically go into that aspect of what you were just mentioning, but I think it sort of touches on it. And maybe maybe you can add more to that discussion here. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, when we think about all of the you know, forces at work that are shaping the social, emotional, cognitive development of adolescents. And we contextualize that within a community like Uvalde, that is 90%, according to the census, Latino, and I believe it's predominantly Mexican-American or Mexican, based on, again, just the historical and, and geopolitical um, context. Then I think that one of the sort of methodological assumptions that one can make if you were going to put on your researcher hat and examine what kinds of things were influencing the mental health of the shooter, then it's not out of the question to say, well, let's look at colorism. Let's look at within group racism, the internalization of racist beliefs. You don't have to be white to believe white supremacist beliefs, to hold white supremacist values. If you live in a community that is heavily patrolled by the border patrol, as what is, as, as all borderline communities are, right, within, I think, 100 miles from the border, if, if the people in power are white, despite the fact that the community is 90% brown, right, which, which it is, the, the, the mayor, Don McLaughlin, is white, how much hate do teens risk internalizing, right? Being told, you know, do you start to hate that you're brown? Do you start to hate that, you know, you, you live, that you're poor, um, that, that you're great? And I don't know that this is true for the shooting. Well, well yeah, I was going to say, uh, you know, as we're recording this, this is just a few days out from the tragedy, the horrific incident that occurred in Uvalde, Texas, where you had a 18-year-old shooter that ran into a school and killed, murdered, uh, massacred. I mean, I'm, I'm at a loss for words at, at what occurred, uh, you know, and, uh, but this, this individual, um, we don't know that their motivations at this point. And so we're not, we're not uh, in this podcast, you know, um, we're not trying to, uh, assume any motivations or, or any, um, prescribe any, you know, motivations to, to the shooter. We're just sort of thinking, you know, without having uh, any further information than what's, 
you know, currently out there, which is not much because even that story ke- keeps shifting daily. Like <laughs> it's incredible what's going on with with the inaction that supposedly the officers who stood as for an hour as this was taking place trying to figure out what to do and and at first you know some of the first reports were that that you know someone had encountered the the shooter as they were going in and even i was thinking well how come they didn't do anything so that story to me from the very beginning just didn't pan out i was like there's something fishy about that and now it turns out that no one even stopped him like this this guy just walks in through an unlocked door around the back of the school and, and is able to get into a, a school and, and do this. But anyway, so we just, we just wanted to put that caveat in here that, that we're not trying to imply any motivations. We're just sort of thinking, you know, uh, about broader implications about what colorism does to, to our communities. Yeah. Thank you for, again, for clarifying, uh, Ruben, because it is very important to state that we are not, I'm certainly not trying to, um, you know, get into the head of the shooter who is now deceased. Um, and we don't know what the motive, what his motive was. Um, but what I am trying to do is talk about how, as a field, human development and family scholars need to do a better job of understanding what kind of within group oppression, within group uh, uh, harm, discrimination, like colorism, right? Like affording privileges, within a Mexican community to those who are lighter skinned, who have more European features, who have green, blue eyes, whose whose noses, right? Like these are things that I grew up with, right? Like, oh, her her nose is small and pointy, right? Well, that's, yeah, more European, right? Like, oh, this person is short and dark and has a, a broad nose uh, because they, they look more, right? They look more indigenous. And, and, and we often as adults are like, well, those are just kids being kids with, and, and, as scholars, we need to look at, well, where does it come from, right? Where do these very harmful colorist um, beliefs stem from? Are we, as adults, as teachers, as parents, as community members, as theos and theas and primos, are we perpetuating these colorist and I believe anti-Indigenous messages because we ourselves don't understand them, because we ourselves heard them when we were growing up and we were told not to get outside, not to go outside because we'll become too pretty back, right? Um, not to walk barefoot because that's savage, right? When I was told to cut my hair because, you know, if I have long braided hair, then I'll look more India. You know, those are things that if you don't think about, you just kind of dismiss, like, you're like, oh, my God, it's just part of growing up. But no, actually, they're part of this, like, the colonization. But they're all part of this long historical systemic erasure of our indigeneity, which, which was adapted to some point, right? And if you think about it, especially in Texas and especially after, um, you know, whether the Treaty in 1848 and now like suddenly Texas is part of the United States. So, so it, it benefited people to be more white adjacent, to, to attach more to their Spanish European root um, because of the racial hierarchy that existed in the United States, which was different than the mestizaje racial caste system that existed in, in Mexico. Um, but I think that these things are just like they're non-existent or they're glossed over in the mainstream human development and family studies research where we just study all oh, Mexican-Americans, all oh, Latinos, you know, as one sample. And we measure their ethnic identity. We measure their ethnic regard. We measure all these other things. And we don't even take account how these in- internalized differences and how they see themselves and whether or not they, they you know, internalized brown hatred toward themselves. A, where does that come from? Is it anti, you know, indigenous? Is it anti-black? I would say probably both, you know? Um, and B, like, what can we do to reverse that harm? Um, how could, you know, even just basic knowledge, psychosocial education about Chicanos indigenous roots and, and de-tribalization, how could that be used as an intervention to promote ethnic awareness. Because what we do know in the literature is that increased ethnic identity absolutely correlates with higher self-esteem, better mental health. So if we're worried about our teens, our Chicano teens falling into depression, you know, having debilitating anxiety, feeling isolation, all the things that we know as a country are afflicting all the youth, 
We know that, like that, you know, we call it the mental health crisis. It was made worse by COVID, but COVID didn't cause it. And we know that things like ethnic identity and, and ethnic pride can, can mitigate that. They can protect against these other harmful forces. Then I think that learn, even just learning about like, hey, how did our people become de-indigenized? What does it mean that I'm brown? It doesn't mean that I'm less black. Right? It means that I may have indigenous ancestry. Um, I think that that's a, a, a potentially powerful but untapped resource. You know, there used to be an old saying back in the Chicano days, la cultura cura, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. And and I wonder if there is, as you're saying, a connection between being uh, dissociated from your community, from your ethnicity, from your ancestry, you know, your indigeneity, if I may hear, how that cultural difference between what it means to belong to a community, a, a close-knit community where you have relationships outside of the family with the neighbors, with the community at large, and how those things, because I think there's, I might have read something about this recently, like there's some a body of research that, that's emerging that, that sort of is looking at the pandemic and is looking at how, you know, because we were indoors for so long for the last, um, at least for a good year, right? Uh, and we were not very um, active uh, outside of our own immediate circles because of that fear of, of that, you know, the, the disease of the, the virus and how that affects people's mental health and how that creates this, this sort of illusion of being uh, alone, of being isolated. Uh, when in fact there are resources, there are people out there. I mean, you have family members there that, but sometimes the family doesn't have the, the, the kind of uh, training to be able to negotiate what's happening with a young person. And so I'm wondering, um, how does educational psychology, uh, through the lens of indigeneity as you're seeing it, how can it be used to address um, situations where we might be able to prevent? Um, more of these tragedies like what happened in Ovalde from occurring? Hmm. I think that there are so many opportunities to, you know, use and leverage knowledge that is already out there that is being taught by elders in our community, by um, elders in, you know, indigenous or groups that are specifically, you know, reconnecting with their indigeneity that can be taken and framed within, you know, evidence-based mental health education programs, parenting support programs to create, you know, interventions or programs or even support groups that are just more culturally relevant, more culturally sensitive than a lot of the parenting programs that exist right now that are really like, oh, well, we're going to teach you how to be white parents. <laughs> like, you put away all of your, you know, that knowledge, you know, stop with the sana sana colita de rana, stop with the aloe vera, like, we're going to teach you how to do the things that we know white middle class parents have done to raise smart kids who go to college. And that, that doesn't work, right? Also, it's not foolproof, because this epidemic that's affecting young people is affecting all young people, not just youth of color. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, as part of my own sort of reconnection with my ancestral indigeneity and learning more about that, and I have to say that I'm very much in the beginning of my journey, um, I, uh, you know, signed up for this online course that was given by the Institute of Chicana Chicano Psychology, led by Manuel Samaripa and his partner, Jessica Samaripa. And so we met on Zoom, and um, there's six six classes. Um and one of the things that really struck me, I mean, it was, it was all great information. I mean, even as someone who's, who has a PhD in psychology, like there was so much <laughs> that I learned just from this lens, right? Like taking off my Western imperial glasses and, and examining these issues of psychology and family from the lens of, of indigeneity and like the harm caused by the invasion and colonization. And so one of the things that I just thought was super profound was shifting the way that we think about parenting by incorporating more indigenous language and ideas about energy, 
And what do I mean by that? And and I know when you say the word energy, especially in academic circles, people are like, oh, now you're talking fluff. You know, that's not that's not rigorous. But hear me out here for a second. So in in family studies, Diana Baumrein, who's a white researcher, decades ago came up with this taxonomy, this classification of parenting style that she says like apply to all parents everywhere. Which of course, we know it's not true. And so the four kinds of parenting styles are authoritative, which is the best time you, you're firm, you set limits, but you're also warm and nurturing. Authoritarian, which is bad because you set limits, but you're not warm and nurturing as a parent. Um, indulgent, which is bad because you give into everything and your kids grow up to be spoiled. And uh, neglectful, right, which is also bad because now you don't provide them even their basic needs. And she said, these, these are it. These are the four. Well, <laughs> when those when the, those four the four, there's only four. The four, right? Like there's only four. <laughs> and they, I mean, those reign supreme. I have students come in all the time and they're like, I want to study, you know, about parenting styles. And I'm like, and that's the parenting styles. Like, let's, let's really try to broaden our cross-cultural application of parenting. So um, one of the things that, or, or one of the patterns that has emerged in the research, of course, um, is that when you apply these four categories, which were developed and validated on white middle class families, when you apply that to black families in the US or to um, Latino families, right? So different ethnicities to use that word. The, the pattern is that black parents are overly harsh, right? So that deficit perspective, right? This, this is the research, this is not me, that they're too authoritarian that they are hard, 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 no nurturing. And uh, Latino parents, primarily Latina moms, because they're studying more, are indulgent and enmeshed. We're like, we're, we're too involved in our children's lives. Right? We, we want too many hugs and too many kisses. You mean like soccer moms? No worse. Like, <laughs> like we just want to hug and kiss them all the time. Okay. And, um, and of course, those are, those are generalizations. But the thing that the four, the four, <laughs> classifications leave out is that if an African-American parent is parenting in a way that might seem overly harsh, let's go back to socialization, maybe what they're doing, maybe, right, is they're trying to communicate to their children that they have to behave in a certain way to minimize the chances of them getting arrested or killed by police, right? So that would be an, an adaptive reason to be to use what Diana Baumrand would call harsh parenting. And in the case of Latino parents, if they're more indulgent, right, it could be because of sort of our more collectivist values, right? Of like we want to spend more time with our kids. And again, this isn't applied to everybody. And I'm generalizing here. We want to be in proximity with them because we understand the importance of being in proximity in relationship with nurturing those relationships. And so it's, it's, it's not a rejection of independence, but it's a, a reaffirmation of our interdependence. But these four classifications, they don't make room for that because mm -hmm. they're, they're based on research that doesn't understand that, right? So, so back to this course I was taking, um, when Jessica Zamaripa was talking about her parenting experiences and kind of applying indigenous ways of knowing, she was talking about, you know, when we, when our kids trigger in us some trauma that we experience as kids, you know, um, often, I don't know if you've heard the term chancla culture, but this is right. So like, oh yeah, that chancla very... culture, where are you going to say something about experiences with the chancla? Oh yeah. I'm very familiar with the chancla culture. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that goes back to colonization, right? So our collectivist ways of knowing and being with family and the importance of being in relationship with one another and nature, like that was all of course disturbed with the invasion and colonization. And so when we get triggered by our kids now, if, if we're parents, a, a lot of that trauma is, is, has been passed down intergenerationally, right? Because of how we had to adapt to all the grief and trauma and loss of having our land stolen and our families, you know, separated and our you know, entire ways of being um, destroyed. Instead of thinking about like our children as behaving, you know, good versus bad, good behavior versus bad behavior, to think about the energy 
like something is off balance, right? So they, their energy is not constructive right now, it's destructive. And how can we then shift our energy to respond to that imbalance in our children to help them find that balance again, understanding that that balance is also right, like temporary, that we're on the slippery slope, right? The slippery mm -hmm. rock that we're that we're constantly shifting in and out of balance. And I just thought that was so beautiful. And I thought, you know, in that moment, what if instead of all of these parenting programs that we have for, you know, at risk, and I am using air quotes, at risk families, you know, right. which is code for brown and black families that are based on the four parenting styles, for example, what if we incorporated like just a simple shift? Like how is your child out of balance right now? And you can use science terms, you know, white sciencey terms to talk about how they're out of balance, but it's a beautiful reframing that gets you out of that, I think, very limiting classification system because we're not robots. We're not just like, I am authoritarian. I am indulgent, right? And, and instead you think about, okay, what is not constructive about how my child is behaving? What am I feeling? Oh, I'm out of balance. How can I shift even in small ways to meet my child so that together our energies, our affect, if you want to use more impure, you know, more scientific language, our affect, our affective states, how they can be in balance, how they can be more harmonious. And I think that if you couple that with some, you know, education, informational settings, whatever you want to call them, about just the Mexican American experience, right? All that we've been through, our history, I think that that could go a really long way toward empowering families, empowering parents to be like, you know what? My people <laughs> used to do family really well, right? Mm -hmm. Before we were forced to, you know, give up our lands and our religion and our, our spirituality and our ways of being. But there are things we can do to really, um, you know, to really take advantage of our collectivist ways, to really like use our, 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 our residual strengths um, not so that we can assimilate and, and be like white parents, because we're not white parents, but so that we can respond to this, these shifts in energy. And it's just a different language. It's a different way of thinking about being, showing up in spaces with your kids. And I think that, that can be very powerful. I, th I think what I'm hearing, uh, and, and thank you for explaining that, that's wonderful. But what I'm hearing here is that you're saying that, uh, if, if I may interpret it differently, is that you're you're sort of looking at the difference between what is for lack of a better way of framing it modern contemporary mainline mainstream approach to family uh structure and and family behaviors and as opposed to a more traditional cultural way of engaging in in a modern day society because there, there's that dichotomy, right? There's this an ex expectation that if you live in the modern uh, world, contemporary society, uh, that you should adapt to the way things are being done today and that the traditional stuff is non-scientific, it, it's uh, backwards, it's antiquated, you need to get with the program, you need to you know, catch up with everybody else. And you're saying that that perhaps that there's a balance that can be struck between, you know, having one foot in the modern world and uh, another foot in the traditional ways of knowing and traditional ways of engaging in family life. Is that kind of what you're sort of getting at in a sense? Yes. And the only thing I would add is that by traditional, I don't mean like colonial traditional, because I think that that word, that's a tricky word, right? That can oh, yeah, be absolutely. Like heavily <laughs> Catholic and, you know, women don't work outside the home and more like more what were our traditions, right? what were our practices when we were able to really be in community and be in family with our indigenous ways of knowing and our indigenous ways of healing, uh, understanding that that can never be replicated 100%, right? right? Nor would I expect people to want to replicate it 100%, but that there is value in these traditions and practices that, that we once, right? If, if you 
identify as someone with indi- of Indigenous descent. And so that's where the Indigenous thread comes into your work is that you're not just saying that that there's value in just a generic tradition way of, of, of looking at, at, at things or, or conducting yourself in, in a family structure or through mental mental health or educational uh, psychology, but that you're saying that it's important to look back to the indigenous ways of knowing and see how those things can help us in, in the modern context, uh, maybe get at some of the solutions to solve some of the, the problems, such as the mental health issue that, that is plaguing a lot of our young people that lead them to commit these atrocious and heinous crimes. Yeah, absolutely. So that those traditions and ways of being also allow us to value that collectivism, right? Because so much of what is plaguing our youth, and I would say even our adults, is the alienation that has developed as a result of being so heavily focused on individualistic ways of being, individualistic values, which we know in a sense are necessary for achievement, like academic achievement, economic achievement, right? Getting getting a good job, all those things that we're sort of told to do as kids, as brown kids, if we want to quote unquote make it in in the U.S. So, yes. You know, this just reminded me of something. I think one of the, the the things that that people have commented on, and and I'm not really sure where I stand on it, but I do have opinions on on this notion of the failure of the Chicano movement. Right there, was, there wasn't just one singular failure of the Chicano movement in general. There were several things that that failed and that that led to its demise. Not that it completely went away. I mean, I, I I do hear the people who say, well, it continued and it's still ongoing. Yes, I get that, but there were some things that it, it didn't fully addressed that led to its sort of minimization. And one of these things was um, the collectivism, the the idea of being in, in a community and that once you make it, once you succeed, that, that you're supposed to kind of look back at the community that helped you, that propped you up and go help that community. And what happened to a lot of our, our Chicano um not just leaders, but just Chicano activists and, and people in general who were uh, involved in the movimiento is that once they got theirs, they were out of the hood. So fueron del barrio and hay los vidrios, you know, it's like you're on your own. And and yeah, they might, you know, help the community donate here and do little things here and there. But by and large, they're not necessarily involved in the community to try to better it as a whole. And so that speaks to what you're saying in terms of like this individualistic uh, sentiment that, that it predominates society. And Armando Navarro, a, a historian who just recently passed away, you know, may you rest in peace, uh, you know, he, he looms large in, in, the, in the Chicano history field. And in 1997, he published an excellent article entitled The Postmortem Politics of the Chicano Movement from 1975 to 1976. In the article, he looks at the Chicano movement and addresses some of the things that, that led to its sort of demise or its minimization. And, and he talks about this. One of the things that he focuses on, this idea of especially in the 80s with the rise of Reagan and, then, you know, the, 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 the yo-yos or, or the me uh, mentality, this individualistic mentality that kind of also helped kind of put the the final nail in in the coffin of that movement because people forgot what they were doing you know what the whole point of the causa was it was it was supposed to be a community-wide effort and then by the end of it it just turned into you know what's in it for me how can i get ahead and and then and that sort of leads you into the you know so-called hispanic generation in the 80s yeah yeah thank you for that sort of historical overview i think it's really important not to forget that and and to like have that as the context because you know I'm thinking of my about my experiences I was always told by my teachers um, not so much by my parents like if you want to make it in life like you gotta get out of here and you know you gotta get out of this you know dump this border town dump and you gotta go places and I was like yeah that's the way to success and of course I was not thinking about family my own family of origin and, and sort of, you know, their well-being. I wasn't thinking about my future family, right? The family I have now. And so when I had kids, and at the time when my son was born, I lived in Oklahoma. When my daughter was born, I lived in Massachusetts. It was like, it hit me for the first time. Like, what have I done? I have moved myself away in the name of like, you know, capitalist achievement, 
with minimal results, to be quite honest. <laughs> like I wasn't like this great success story by any means. Oh, don't, don't, like you, you're doing good. I mean, look at your work. I mean, that's something that speaks Thank for you. itself. Thank you. That, and yes. Um, but I realized like now I'm going to raise children away from their abuelita and abuelito and their tias and tias and primos. And that was such an important part of my upbringing. And now I have made all these decisions in the name of achievement, in the name of individualism, in the name of success as defined by, you know, imperial colonized ways of thinking. And, and, and that was really scary. Um, and so, so what I do now, which is not a remedy, but in addition to just how I've changed my own you know, ethnic racial socialization with my kids, which I'm very intentional about, I try to go back to Laredo as often as I can. It's not always easy, but like they need to physically be with my family. I need to physically be with my family. Um, and, and, you know, I am one of millions, you know, who also chose that path because we believe we internalize those values, right? Those individualistic values. And we believe that that was the way to success. And so I think there's some, you know, some 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 similarities here in what you're talking about was sort of like why the Chicano movement did not become more successful than it was because th there was dispersion, right? Like there were also, like you said, people who, who made it and who were really successful and who sort of knew more about them. But I think also when you when you disseminate those voices, um, I mean, it's good to, to be spread out, but at the same time, you lose some of that concentrated power. Right. Those are my thoughts on that. Well, I think that this is a good place to end this conversation. I mean, uh, we could talk for another three hours, I'm sure. Um, but I've taken up enough of your time today. And um, is there anything else in the works? I, I know you mentioned that you have an article that you're working on. Um, what do you have an article? Is is there something else that, that you have in the pipeline that you want to share with, with our audience uh, that they might want to be on the lookout for? Sure. Um, I do have a, an article under review right now. Um, it's a case study, uh, a Mexican-American woman sort of like testimony of witnessing colorism and not doing anything about it. So it's a little bit of like how disorienting that can be when you don't have the language for it, because you, you know, within our communities, we're just like, well, we're all Mexicanos, we're all Chicanos. And so sometimes we're, it, it's very difficult for us to see, especially if we don't think about anti-indigeneity within our community, it's very difficult for us to see and name when people are discriminating based on phenotype, based on how we look. So, so that hopefully will come out, I don't know, in the next few months. Um, and then I'm also, I, I'm, I'm really passionate about public scholarship and I would love to speak to you offline about this. Um, but I've just learned that the traditional mechanisms and methods for disseminating academic research are not only infuriatingly slow, but they don't always benefit the people that they're intended to benefit, right? And so yeah, I've been, I hear you. <laughs> yeah. So I, I love what you all are doing with your podcast. Like that's that's so impactful. Um, I think we need more things like this. Um, and then just other like I would love to connect with anyone who wants to discuss ideas for how to create more public outlets, venues, or you know, scholarship specific to Chicano families, um, Chicano psychology or well-being. I am I'm, I am in, in conversation with Manuel and Jessica Samaripa at the Institute of Chicano, Chicano Psychology, but like if you're doing family scholarship or educational psychology or human development and you're interested in, you know, exploring public scholarship outlets, I would love to, to speak to you. And and how can people reach out to you? Yes, great question. Um, so they can reach me at my um, email. It's uh, a Verdin. I don't know if you have show notes, but I'll spell it out. It's a v as in Victor e r d i n at t w u or Texas Women's University dot edu. Excellent, excellent. Well, once again, um, Dr. Azucena Verdin, thank you for being on, on the podcast. Thank you for sharing uh, your work with us, your knowledge, your expertise, your thoughts, your opinions. Uh, it was a wonderful conversation, and uh, I hope we can do this again. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening to Tales from Atlantis, a project of the Chimali Institute of Mesoamerican Arts. If you enjoy the show, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. You can do this by visiting talesfromastlantis.com and clicking support the podcast. 
Your continued support will help keep the podcast ad-free and independent. Until next time, Timo Itase.